the Archdiocese of New York. The story of the faith in this region began with Irish immigrants, was sustained by a courageous and visionary bishop, and carries on today under the leadership of its current apostle, Cardinal Timothy Dolan. There's a whole smorgasbord of great examples from my predecessors. I inherit all the, the good that they brought out. And I often think, I hope 10, 20 years from now, one of my successors will say, hey, you know, Dolan did some decent things and I'm grateful for him. This is the story of the bishops of America, the shepherds of the past and the shepherds of today, who through their callings and ministry carry the church into the future. It's also the story of their parish, their church, the cathedral, This is The Chair, an exploration of what it means to be an apostle in America. In southeastern New York State, Halfway between Washington, D.C. and Boston, sitting at the mouth of the historic Hudson River, is one of the great cities of the world, New York City. Sea City of the Archdiocese of New York. The Archdiocese of New York is, first of all, only part of New York City. Uh, it includes three of the five boroughs, Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island. The other two, Brooklyn and Queens, are a separate diocese. That's the Diocese of Brooklyn, which is one of the largest dioceses in the country in its own right. So we're three of the five boroughs of New York City. But in addition to that, the Archdiocese includes seven upstate counties, which encompasses just an enormous amount of geographical area, from, again, Staten Island at the southernmost point, all the way up almost to Albany. I think one of the really interesting things about this archdiocese, it's the second largest in the country, second only to Los Angeles. You have a melting pot of different Catholic ethnic groups. Well, I think one of the things that makes the, pe the people, the, the men, women, children of the archdiocese today and going back, you know, two centuries plus is that incredible diversity because it's been such the immigrant capital of the United States. So many people, this was their first place they came when they came to the United States. The reason why New York is so rich, so diverse, why the church has been so rich, so diverse, and so strong, because it has reflected in so many ways uh, the gorgeous mosaic of the people of New York City. Prior to European settlement, Manhattan was inhabited by Native American tribes. The first European to reach the area was the Italian Catholic explorer Giovanni da Verrazzano, who sailed into New York Harbor in 1524. Now, this was followed by the explorations of Henry Hudson in 1609. Dutch settlers soon arrived and established a colony on the southern tip of Manhattan called New Amsterdam. Soon after, in 1664, the Dutch surrendered the city to the English, who gave the city its current name, New York. In 1682, the first governor of New York is appointed, and he's a Catholic, Thomas Dongan. He's 48 years old, and he comes into the position because of King James II. One of the great things that he did in his time as governor was he granted what was called a Charter of Liberties and Privileges to just offer the ability for Catholics and other religions to practice their faith freely without persecution. In 1688, the Glorious Revolution took place. King James II was overthrown by his son-in-law, William of Orange, who was married to his daughter, Mary. They were Protestants. A lot of the, the movement protecting Catholics and other minority religions in the New York area really began to unravel. There was laws against priests entering New York City 
It said if a priest entered and then he was expelled, if he came back a second time, he would be executed. From about 1690 until the time of the American Revolution, there was no resident priest. Once the French came on our side of the American Revolution, George Washington, our future president, put an end to all that. We might say that this era was an era of good feelings for Catholics and Protestants in early America. Even here in New York City, the first parish was established in 1785, St. Peter's on Barclay Street. And Protestants were helpful in its founding. That parish, which still exists, it's not the original church, but it's still the same parish, has been home to a diversity of people over the centuries, including two people most notable. One is Elizabeth Ann Seton. Many of us know her story. She's the first native-born American to be canonized as a saint. Mother Seton grew up in New York City. She made her first communion and confirmation at St. Peter's. And also, and it was an important place in her spiritual life for the years that she lived here after her conversion. Also another man who is uh, Pierre Toussaint. Toussaint was a slave who'd fled Haiti with his owner during the slave uprising in 1787. He's freed in 1807 and then is married in St. Peter's Church in 1811. He was very generous in terms of helping the poor, helping the orphans. He established orphanages. He's known to have ministered the sick during the plague or the cholera. He would go and help others without any really regard for his own well-being. Toussaint was buried in Old St. Patrick's Church and then when his cause for canonization was opened, his body was moved to St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue. In 1808, Pope Pius VII made New York the seat of one of four new American dioceses carved out of Baltimore. And he named the Irish Dominican Richard Luke Concanon as its first bishop. Although he was consecrated bishop of the diocese, he actually never set foot in American soil due to the embargoes of the Napoleonic Wars. In 1814, another Irish Dominican, John Connolly, was named the second Bishop of New York. Now, he arrived in 1815. He had four priests, three churches, and approximately 15,000 Catholics. New York City's first cathedral is Old St. Patrick's, built in 1815. It is a restrained Gothic revival, so the exterior almost has a Georgian feeling. One of the wonderful features of the exterior is the sort of wavy, leaning wall, which really points to the Catholic history in New York. The interior has these Gothic revival features, and whenever we think about Gothic architecture, we really can think about the experience of being in a forest. This was the Cathedral of New York for 70 years, which in itself is, is quite a history. Our status was changed to that of a parish church when the new and much larger and more famous St. Patrick's was built in Midtown and New York became an archdiocese. We were elevated once again in 2010 when Pope Benedict XVI declared us a basilica. And we are the first and only basilica in the archdiocese of New York. The fact that we're able to display the, the papal coat of arms here is one of the privileges of a basilica, our, our connection to Peter, to the Holy Father, throughout the history of this place is just an incredible gift. In 1842, John Hughes, coadjutor bishop since 1837, became the fourth bishop of the diocese. And a few years later, in 1845, the Irish potato famine began unprecedented successive waves of Irish immigrants from Ireland poured into the city, and Irish Catholics soon began to transform the city, led by their Irish-born bishop. John Hughes, better known as Dagger John. One of the most famous stories of Dagger John is his defense of New York City's churches during this wave of, of nativism. And as the story goes, churches and convents were being burned in other cities, and there was a real threat to the same structures here in New York City. And Archbishop Hughes said to the mayor, if one Catholic church in New York City is touched, I'm gonna to tell the Irish to turn the city into a second Moscow. A few decades earlier, when Napoleon's armies were marching on Moscow, they burned the city. So when the soldiers arrived, there was nothing for them to eat. Not one Catholic church was touched in New York City and no shots were fired. 
He ultimately established the first seminary that would last in the Archdiocese, St. Joseph's. He founded Fordham University, originally a St. John's College, that were founded together in 1841. He began the process of building the cathedral in the late 1850s. It was finished in 1879, when Archbishop, by now at this point, Cardinal McCluskey, was the Archbishop of New York. St. Francis Xavier Cabrini is the first United States citizen to have been canonized. And when she was in Italy growing up, she originally wants to become a missionary in China. But Pope Leo XIII said, no, I want you to go west and not east. And she gets on a boat and comes to America. And in a sense, the rest is history. She not only changes the Catholic and impacts the Catholic community in New York City, but in so many other dioceses and archdioceses around the United States as well. In the 20th century, uh, New York is guided by a series of charismatic and influential bishops, including Patrick Hayes, Francis Spellman, Terence Cook, John O'Connor, Edward Egan, and today, Timothy Dolan. As the church progressed into the latter half of the 20th century, the Archdiocese of New York became less of a temporal institutional force, although it continues to influence the, the political realm, but much more of a spiritual force within the ranks of its faithful. And this is especially true under the leadership of John Cardinal O'Connor. O'Connor was very outspoken in his defense of the sanctity of life. He was also a passionate defender of organized labor and an advocate of the poor and homeless. He was not shy in front of a camera or a microphone and gave great witness to the church's teaching. He had a, a famously wonderful relationship with Mayor Ed Koch. Uh, they co-authored a book. And I think he really represents that legacy of, of John Hughes to be a fearless voice in the press, not afraid to use the influence that his office has, but never making it personal. He and Ed Koch, for all their differences over policy and everything else, could laugh and enjoy a meal together. I think that's a really welcome lesson for our day and age. Throughout its history, the seat of apostolic authority for all of the archbishops of New York has been St. Patrick's Cathedral. This is an extraordinary cathedral, and it really signals the arrival of the Catholic population. And one of the incredible things to think about in this truly grand cathedral is how very poor the population that built it was. Famously, the archbishop said that this cathedral was built with the pennies of the city's poor. And, you know, to think about this palace, God's palace, people coming in, living in tenements, working in factories. The Catholic population in New York at this time is an immigrant population. To come into this building to pray and to participate in the liturgy must have been truly transcendent. I think what having St. Patrick as our, our patron, many times over, patron of this church, patron of our diocese, patron of our cathedral, it's the missionary spirit which we can so easily lose sight of when we think of the missions you know we think of developing nations and you know sending a check to some religious order the missions are right here it's the people on these sidewalks that need to hear the gospel that need to meet jesus christ saint patrick's is striking from a distance especially now that it has been cleaned and restored. It is a sort of glimmering white, right in the heart of Manhattan. But of course, when you come up close to it, you can really see the incredible detail, this sort of lacy carving of the marble cladding, carving of the shield of the diocese and of the tracery. Also the bronze doors and tympanum, which reveal the life of the church to us. This is a solid, big building. It takes up an entire city block, and yet it is light. The style is a decorated neo-Gothic, and so it's really taking its precedent from the old medieval European cathedrals. Its spires reach into the heavens. The tracery and the stained glass is 
delicate and intricate, and every part of this unfolds. And so when you look at the um, casing of the organ, which is really grand and very impressive from a distance, and then if you focus in and see that the carving is so fine of the angels. St. Patrick's is one of the most well-known and prominent cathedrals in the world. It is truly magnificent. Walking around the cathedral is really a wonderful sensory experience. There's, of course, very fine music at St. Patrick's, and, and then visually, it's a feast. And that's appropriate because the cathedral is a foretaste of the heavenly banquet. This is also the place from which the archbishop teaches. It's the apostolic seat. My favorite place to pray would be in the cathedra, the chair. So every morning at 7, I have the 7 a.m. Mass here at St. Patrick's, and from the chair is my favorite place to pray, the Mass, because that's the greatest prayer we have, the Holy Sacrifice and the Mass. The bishop's chair, or cathedra, inside St. Patrick's Cathedral symbolizes Cardinal Dolan's authority as the Apostle of New York. Cardinal Timothy Dolan was born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1950, the oldest of five children. Well, I had thought about being a priest for a long time, but I was only two or three, believe it or not, when I was with my grandmother at Sunday Mass, and I said, oh, I want to be a priest. Now, on the way home, on the walk home, I'm sure when the fire truck passed, I said, I want to be a fireman too, but she would often remind me of that. There was just sort of like this tender, boyish enthusiasm about the church, about the priesthood, and that was nurtured. Oh, living only a block away, I was often called to serve the morning mass, and I just got to know the priests, and they were so good. You know, they would do things like on Fridays after mass, Father Callahan would say to the two servers, come with me on my communion calls. And he'd go visit, you know, six or eight shut-ins and housebound and bring Holy Communion, and then we'd stop at the bakery on the way back. And I can remember simply saying, I would love to do like they do. We'd never miss Sunday Mass. We'd never miss praying before meals. For them to sacrifice to send us to a Catholic school was extraordinarily important. Whenever I said I wanted to be a priest, they were very, very conscious never to be coercive about it, but they'd say, we'll be happy whatever you do. Boy, if you're a priest, that'd be great. So that there was a very simple, very tender atmosphere of faith there. Mom is still alive, thanks be to God, 92, in great health. When I finally uh, kind of made it official, I was applying to go to the seminary. Father Callahan, the pastor, called Mom and Dad up just to kind of talk to him about the seminary and all. And he said to them, you know, Bob and Cheryl, said, you're, you're gonna have five kids, and all of them are gonna probably get married and move out and start their own families. You're always gonna have 10 because he's going to be a priest of the archdiocese. So you get used to him being at home every Sunday. Now, my mom reminds me of that because I haven't been home for most of my priesthood. <laughs> Timothy Dolan was ordained a priest for the archdiocese of St. Louis on June 19, 1976. He first served as a parish priest in the archdiocese until 1979, when he was sent to the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C to work on a doctorate in American church history. After receiving his PhD, Father Dolan returned to St. Louis to work as a parish priest. I love my years there as a parish priest. In 1987, I was asked to be a secretary at the Apostolic Nunciature, which is the Vatican Embassy in Washington, D.C. Amazingly enlightening years. You can imagine for an American Catholic historian being there at the at the nunciature where so much happens. I went back in 92 and then I taught at the seminary. Kenrick Glennon Seminary, the great seminary for the Archdiocese of St. Louis. Until 94, I was asked to be rector of the North American College in Rome. Yippee, wow, where I had had this happy four years as a student. And I was there for seven happy years. In 2001, Father Dolan was appointed Auxiliary Bishop of St. Louis. One year later, he was named the 10th Archbishop of Milwaukee. After serving the people of Wisconsin for seven years, 
Pope Benedict XVI appointed Timothy Dolan as the 10th Archbishop of New York. On February 5th, 2009, I got the call from the Papal Nuncio, Archbishop Pietro Sambi, to say the Holy Father wants you to be Archbishop of New York. And I said, well, Eccellenza, I am very honored and very grateful and very flattered. And I said, uh, can I simply speak honestly? I am very happy here in Milwaukee. I don't know if I can do a good job in New York. And I think there are probably better candidates. And he said to me, yeah, you're right. But so what? The Holy Father wants you to go. <laughs> that was another lesson in humility. So of course I said yes. And uh, happy day in this magnificent St. Patrick's Cathedral. In the years since becoming Archbishop, and then in 2012, Cardinal, Timothy Dolan has strived to live out his apostolic mission to govern, to teach, and to sanctify his people. When I came up then for the announcement that I was to be Archbishop of New York, it was the Monday before Ash Wednesday, and Cardinal Egan and I, he was my immediate predecessor and I loved him, we kind of celebrated the Mass, and then afterward, I said, do you mind if we go down under the altar so that I can see? I said, well, I want to see where my predecessors are buried because I owe them a lot. And I also want to see where I'm going to be buried, because that's good for me to keep in mind. So we did. And you know, they all would have brought particular gifts. When I think I need some exceptional fortitude to defend the church, I think of John Hughes. When I think of a, a more gentle man who had a love for the poor, I think of Cardinal Hayes. When I think of a man who had immense administrative acumen, I would think of a Cardinal Francis Spellman. When I think of a, of a gentleman who suffered and showed us the intrinsic value of life, I think of Cardinal Terence Cook. When I think again of a brave man, beloved by everybody, who stood up for the defenseless, especially the baby in the womb, I think of Cardinal O'Connor. When I need some help in making some tough decisions, I think of Cardinal Egan. There's a whole smorgasbord of great examples from my predecessors. I inherit all the, the good that they brought out. And I often think, I hope 10, 20 years from now, one of my successors will say, hey, you know, Dolan did some decent things that I'm grateful for. I hope. <laughs>